Okay, I believe we are now recording. All right, well, first, welcome everybody to the first deep, Deal Deep Dive live call coming to you live from lovely downtown Clovis, New Mexico. It is about 4.30 here, and uh, I'm excited to have you all on the call. I see the participant number going up, so I'm going to give it a, another quick second. I want to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. We are going to move pretty quickly. Those of you who know me know that I speak or tend to speak on the fast side. So, so cool. Let's get started. So I um, first want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to be here for this the very first Deal Deep Dive Live call uh, where we're going to be performing an in-depth financial analysis that does not suck, at least hopefully will not suck. Uh, at least it will be honest and accurate. Um, I'm your host, Mitch Messer. I'm with Home Price Properties. I've been a real estate investor for 21 years. Um, this doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. This means I've had 21 years to make them. Um, I, I want to kind of run through this first. Let's make sure this works. There we go. Uh, we want to talk about the, uh, the agenda. Um, I'm giving us half an hour. Uh, to get this thing rolling. Oh, a couple of uh, quick, we'll talk about the overall ground rules in a minute, but I just want to make sure if uh, we're going to keep our eyes on the chat. I'll ask you, Corinna, just kind of keep your eye on the chat. Uh, and if anyone has any issues, um, then they can raise them. Just uh, quickly, if everyone can, if anyone can't hear me, can they just mention it in the chat? I'm coming across choppy. If there's any issues with the audio or the video, can you just hit the chat? Uh, you're all muted for now, so um, you won't be able to speak. But if you have any issues, uh, throw it in the chat, and we will um, do our best to try to figure it out. But I think most people can hear me. Um, and, Mitch, there's a and, few people on um, hold I waiting. Can't hear you, Korea, so I see people chatting. And hmm. Mitch, can you hear me now? I don't. I'm just take a peek in there. I think the audio is good. Okay, so uh, I think we're in good shape. So here we go. Uh, the purpose of this call is this, this entire call is born out of frustration. I was on Bigger Pockets uh, early this week, and there was a guy talking about this wonderful deal that he had. He had uh, owner financing, he was buying a subject to a great rate of return, and he wanted to talk about how he could enhance the deal. And uh, I ran the numbers, and I responded back to him. I said, uh, basically, dude, you don't have a deal here. Um, you forgot to include vacancy and maintenance and all these major expense items that by the time you, you factor those in, you go from a, I think he had like $1,000 positive cash flow. By the time I was done, it was like a negative 230 bucks negative cash flow. So no deal. And that scared the heck out of me. And I see this all the time. I, I see this from investors. I see this from um, wholesalers. Folks don't understand the numbers. And uh, we don't have a ton of time, um, but I will uh, kind of give you a, an abbreviated version of my horror story. Uh, I started investing in 99. We were going strong until 2007 and 8, where we got crushed by the downturn. And we got crushed because I did not understand my numbers. I did not realize that at the time we were running like maybe a $35, $100 positive cash flow. And when things got ugly, as they did in 2008, I got crushed because we didn't have the, the cushion. So I'm doing this call to spare people that pain and suffering because times are about to get hard if they haven't gotten so already. And I want to make sure that everybody at least understands how deals should be analyzed so that you can make money in this business, because if you can't make money in the business, you don't stay in it. Some quick ground rules. You'll see that uh, behind, aside each of these numbered uh, items is a number in brackets. <laughs> That's the number of minutes I've given myself to cover this topic. So um, we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna try to be brisk. Uh, the main ground rule is uh, please keep yourself muted until you're called on. We're gonna have a section uh, 
in the middle of this where I will be looking for people to provide input, but I really want to get through the three phases of deal analysis before we get too into the crosstalk. There'll be a bunch of folks on the call. We're up to 28 participants so far. So it will be very, very chaotic if I try to let everybody uh, dive in. So I'm going to ask that you mute yourself until you're called on, um, but we will you'll have a, plenty of opportunity to ask your questions. I'll stay here as long as I need to to answer questions within reason, uh, and we'll make sure that, that all gets covered. Um, I tend to speak fast. Yes, I'm from New York. I talk fast. Uh, I will try my best to modulate my speed, uh, but please do your best to pay attention and keep up. If you got the TV running while I'm talking, you probably want to turn the TV off and talk, try to focus because I'm going to try to cover this stuff fairly quickly. Um, so uh, that's pretty much all the ground rules. Um, the goal here, I'm not going to present you with the only way you can analyze a deal. I'm going to present you with the way that I analyze a deal and I've been doing it for, let's say the last 10 years. I won't do a deal now without analyzing it in advance. Uh, and probably asking a few other people to analyze it with me so that I'm not making any mistakes. So, um, but I don't want to pretend that, that I'm the only person in the world who knows how to analyze a deal. I know that there are some experienced investors on this call with me. I'm looking for them to provide some input as we go along. Uh, but I, I do want to cover in some detail how deals should be analyzed and at very least what elements should be part of it. So uh, with that said, let's, Get going. So the three phases of deal analysis. Uh, first is input verification, which is just a fancy way of saying, making sure that the data you're being fed is accurate. Um, we're gonna talk about this quite a bit as we get into the, the lightning round of the session. But um, for those of you who have seen a deal being presented by a wholesaler, or for those of you who are wholesalers yourself, you know that what makes a deal good or bad depends on um, the basic facts. What kind of uh, after repair value are it's got? What kind of rent are you expecting? Um, these are important things to know. And I don't expect anybody to take my word for it when I'm presenting a deal. And I don't take anyone else's word for it when they're presenting a deal. I want to verify that what you're telling me is the R is actually the R. I want to verify that what you're telling me is market rent is actually market rent. Um, so verifying all those inputs to the extent that you can it is going to be the first part of analyzing a deal. Uh, second is uh, goal achievement, I'll call it. Uh, what it really is is running your numbers, but uh, I put goal achievement there because I want to make it clear this assumes that you have a goal. You can't, you can't assess whether a deal is good or bad if you don't have a goal. If you, don't, if you can't tell me what makes a deal good, then running the numbers isn't gonna help you because you'll get a number, but it won't be clear whether this number is good for you or bad for you. So you need to have a goal and then you need to fiddle with your uh, equation, your calculator, your tool, your tool to get to achieve that goal. What do I have to do to this spreadsheet to adjust it so that I can get the goal that I want? For example, my goals typically are cash flow and cash on cash return. I'm looking for a specific cash flow or at least a minimum cash flow and a minimum cash on cash return. And I'll adjust typically the purchase price until I get what I need. But, but I know what my numbers are and I'm not suggesting my numbers should be yours, but you can't work the equation unless you understand what you're trying to achieve. And that requires having the goal. So running the numbers is the second phase. And then the third phase is deal enhancement. Okay, I ran the numbers and I got, I achieved my goals. I got 10% cash on cash and I got 300 bucks a month positive cash flow. Uh, deal enhancement is where the real creativity in this business comes in because now you're gonna ask yourself, well, what do, I, what do I need to do to make this deal better? What could I do to make this deal better? Uh, and that's what separates an eh investor from a great investor. That's what separates a, a mediocre deal from a great deal, is the ability to, to turn some knobs and make some adjustments that turn a, a base hit into a grand slam home run. So in a nutshell, these are the three phases of deal analysis and your mileage may vary, but more or less, you're gonna have to go through these three uh, phases uh, in order to analyze a deal and, and make, make sense of it. 
So let's talk about input verification uh, just briefly. Um, primarily, I'm looking at accurately estimating the after repair value, fair market rent, repairs, property taxes, and insurance. I have on here for your reading pleasure how you can get these, these uh, values. I'm not going to go into detail in how it's done because that's been done to death all over the place, including bigger pockets. How you get R, how you get fair market rent. These are some resources, and uh, we can talk about uh, uh, when we get to the live view part. We can talk about how you may have come up with yours, but uh, suffice it to say that there are plenty of ways to get these. There is no excuse for not having at least a rough idea what each of these is for your deal. Um, and again, Experts may differ on exactly what amount is the R, but within a reasonable range, there shouldn't be a lot of confusion. It shouldn't be, you know, one person thinks it's 100 and another person thinks it's $30,000. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that, that broad. Um, so uh, that's input verification. These are the, generally speaking, the inputs uh, that you don't know that you're going to have to either identify or estimate. Uh, for things like repairs, you will presumably have don't gone uh, through and done a, an inspection and you're, you'll have some sense of what the repairs are that are needed. Uh, property taxes is available online. Insurance, you can get that information from a, an experienced broker. Um, so there's nothing here that should be all that surprising to anybody on this call. You'd need to get all this information in order to be able to do uh, the next part. So we can talk about the next part. Goal achievement. Uh, so um, I won't I won't harp on this, I will just talk about it. Uh, I don't, and hopefully no one on this call gets excited about houses as houses. Houses are a machine that generates money. Um, and so the real question that you can ask about the machine is how much money does it generate and how efficiently does it generate this money? And that's what cash flow and cash on cash, on, cash return do for you. That's what they tell you. And so when I talk to investors and I say, you know, what kind of deal are you looking for? And they say, oh, I want a good deal. Um, that gives me significant pause because you can't tell me, if you can't tell me what a good deal is for you, then you're not ready to be an investor in my opinion because you, you don't know uh, what you want. And it's not hard, uh, but you should understand what this means, what cash flow means, what cash and cash return is, um, and not just, you know, pull the number out of the hat. Uh, and we'll talk more about this uh, as we get to the, uh, to the live part. Um, and then we'll talk deal enhancement. Uh, there's a bunch of ways, and this is to me the fun part of, of real estate investing, is taking a deal that everybody else looks at and goes, eh, that's not so bad, and doing a few things, um, applying a few tweaks to turn that mediocre deal into a, a killer deal. Um, and there are three general ways that you can make a deal better. You can maximize your financials. So uh, what tweaks can I make to increase my cash on cash return or keep, increase my cash flow? And uh, that's one category. Uh, the other is how can I serve the seller better? Uh, so for example, uh, other ways I can perhaps defer payments so that the seller doesn't have a huge tax hit. Uh, that's an example of uh, something that serves the seller better. Um, minimizing risk could be ways that I um, typically, it's going to be things that I can do to keep more money in my pocket and spend less of it, because usually risk turns into, translates into trans, trans, financial um, hardship. So if I can keep more of my money, I can minimize my risk. But there are some strategies that I can employ that don't involve money that can still increase risk, I mean, m minimize risk. For example, I might choose to um, run my title search uh, early uh, or um, We'll, we'll cover this in more detail later, but I just wanted to throw these up there because I want to be clear on what the uh, what what I mean by deal enhancement. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk today about the 7089 Vest Away, which is a nice house in Jonesboro, Georgia. Uh, it is not uh, actively contracted by Home Park Properties, so I'm not trying to sell anybody anything on this call. I couldn't if I wanted to, um, but. Uh, and that's why I wanted to pick this one because there's no self-interest here. I'm not trying to pitch this. Um, so this is here just for illustrating illustrative purposes. Um, but this is the deal we're going to talk about. And all right. So um, I'm going to click this link 
uh, and it's going to take me to hopefully if things work out the uh, Google Sheet. If you want to play along on your computer, if you type in that URL uh, right below the address, it should take you to the same Google Sheet I'm about to modify. Uh, I'm going to have it on my screen so you won't need to, but if you wanted to pull it up on your own screen and see it, you'll see me making my changes as we go. So uh, let's hope to goodness this actually works. Slow. Very slow. And dang it. Yeah, it's got to get all the way from wherever it is to New Mexico. Let's cut it some slack. Well, while that's thinking, let me just take a quick peek at the chat and make sure everything is okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, now, what is a bit low? Okay. Uh, I'll try to talk louder. Uh, can anybody slash everybody see the Google Sheet? Oh, I see people hopping on there. So hopefully they can see. Good to go. Okay, excellent. So uh, this is the sheet that I prepared. I'm going to say a few things about uh, the Google, sorry, the uh, Bigger Pockets calculator, because a few of you have heard me say this. Uh, I have nothing against the Bigger Pockets calculator. Uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Hold on a second. Someone's trying to get in. I thought I could let everybody in. Bear with me. I think Karina is taking care of it. Okay. Thanks, Karina. I got it. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal with the, uh, the calculator. Bigger Pockets provides uh, deal calculators that will uh, run numbers for you. And I think that's, I think that's lovely. Uh, however, my concern is it, it weakens your ability to think for yourself and it, it loosens your connection to your own numbers. I would much rather see people Get a spreadsheet. Google Sheets is free. If you have a Google account, you can hop in here and create your own. Um, and just test yourself. See if you can create a spreadsheet that has the data elements that we're talking about, and we'll talk about them in a second. Uh, and if you can, using the data that you're providing, calculate your own net operating income and, and operating expenses and pre-tax pre cash flows and therefore cash on cash return and monthly net cash flow. And then once you've done that, then go back to the bigger pockets calculator and verify that it shows you the same thing that you're getting. Um, but as we're gonna see, when you run your own uh, spreadsheet, you'll discover that there are assumptions that you have to make in here um, that they have to make in the bigger pockets calculator as well. It's just that you don't know what those assumptions are because you don't see them. You just see a number pop out. You put some stuff in, you hit a button and a number pops out. And Sorry, my lovely wife just came in to say she's heading out into the wilds of Clovis, New Mexico. Um, so, uh, so I have nothing against their spreadsheet. This is mine. Um, and I won't give you mine. I'll help you do yours or I'll look at yours uh, and compare yours to mine. But I don't want people to copy mine. I want you to come up with your own that makes sense for you and then use that. Um, but, but get into the habit of, of understanding what these data elements are. And uh, that way you won't be caught short if, if the bigger pocket calculator isn't available to you. Uh, so uh, here's where I want to get interactive. So Karina, um, if you can help me with this, I'm trying to, I don't know if I can unmute all or not easily. Okay. I can unmute okay. all of people here. Uh, hopefully you can see me as well. If you want the sheet, so I want to make sure that and I am. Um, I do want to be able to to uh, go out there and call on folks for their feedback, but I also.
screen, but you can see you all there. Okay, so we're back to the spreadsheet, I hope. Um, let us pick on some people. Let's start at the top. Sure. With R. Mitch, I'll go first. Mitch, I'll go first. Um, I've got an R of 94.9. Is that reasonable or is that ridiculous? Uh, and who's going to tell me whether that is? Or I got an ARP. Let me pick on. Uh, if you can, if we can get you unmuted. You can maybe pick on yourself, but give me a second. Let's see. I wanted to do this with voices. I can check the chat. So if you let's do that while I'm Mitch, figuring out how to do this. Mitch, can um, you hear me? Who wants someone can in the chat uh, tell me if you think the 949 is accurate or off or high or low or what? Mitch. Uh, we'll figure can out how to get me? people unmuted so they can actually speak. But in the short term, um, seems a little high. Okay. Some people think it's high, some think it's low. Um, so here's my proposal, is that um, what I care about is not opinion. I want to hear, if you think it's high, high based on what? If you think it's low, low based on what? Um, okay, who else in the extra? Someone's trying to talk. Yeah, I can't hear. I hope it's not my headphones. Uh, let's see. It could be me. I got my headphones on. Oh, you know what? Let me double check here. Maybe I'm not playing the audio through my. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Someone tried talking. Let's see if I can hear you. Mitch, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Can anybody hear me? <laughs> My part, I yes, I can hear you. I can hear okay. you. Okay. <laughs> oh. hey, typing. I hear Kareem is oh. typing. Can you hear me talking? Yes. Okay, there you me? go. Yes. Yes. And everyone else right. can hear me too. Now you're set. Okay, cool. That was on my part. So sorry about that, folks. That was me. Um, so uh, this will be a lot faster because if you type like I do, typing could be could take us forever. Um, so some people say hi, some people say low. Um, tell me uh, why high, why low? What are we What are we talking about? What ninety four nine is what I got based on. I used uh, uh, recent sales and I used um, I, I kind of leaned on Zillow. Um, who else out there come up, came up with something different? Mitch, uh, we came up with something different. Is that Vernell? Yes, yes, okay. how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, what'd you come up with? Yeah, when we, we actually took recent sales uh, of about three properties that were renovated in the area. And uh, the, uh, the average selling price was 142 to 140,000. So our, our, our ARV was closer to that because basically with the, with the 94.9, I would think that's basically if you want to rent the property as is. But if you renovated it and then you took, uh, you know, uh, comparative market analysis from the other two properties, it was more around 130, 140. Got it. Got it. Okay, that's fair. Um, any... hey, hey, Mitch. Uh, yes. Hi. It, it's Naquan. Um, how hey, you doing, Naquan. Mitch? I, doing fine. Um, I, got, I got around a similar ARV. Um, what I noticed about this particular property in the area, um, this particular property has a garage that holds two spaces. Um, I looked at similar other comps in the area and I noticed they don't have a garage area. Or um, I looked at similar spots around the same, I looked at similar properties around the same square footage and I've seen sales around similar ARVs around 140 for this particular property. Got it, okay. Um, so let me say this. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. I will, I will mention a couple of things uh, just briefly. Uh, let me make the distinction between there's really two kinds of ARVs, and I should have mentioned this before, but we're kind of running light on time. There is a ARV relating to retail and an ARV relating to rental. So a, a value of a property, once you've made it retail ready, which would be 
the top end, ready to sell to a retail buyer. It's beautiful, it's polished, everybody loves it. Um, and then there's the ARV that's good enough for a rental tenant um, that's not gonna have the bells and whistles. We're not gonna put marble in, we're not gonna put tile on the floor. We're gonna get it good enough to, for somebody to, to move in there and, and live in there as a tenant. Um, so that's one thing I want to point out. The other is because this is a, a buy and hold property, the ARV, to be honest, I don't care about as much because I'm buying this property for the cash flow. Uh, the ARV matters, but it doesn't matter too much because I'm not going to buy it, fix it, and flip it. I'm going to hold it. Uh, I just don't want to buy it above ARV. So if I think ARV is, let's say, let's say 100, <clears throat> I don't want to be buying it for 120 because if something goes wrong and I have to sell it fast, now I'm stuck. Because if I have to sell it fast, I'm going to have to come out of pocket to get this thing sold. Um, so let's let's stipulate um, that my 94.9 is a bit on the low side. I'm more than happy to make this change. In fact, it helps me. Mitch, uh, Mitch, this is fix. Anthony. Hey, Anthony. One one notation that I've noted there, it's really a 1.5 bathroom, not two bathrooms. So correct, it is, it is two bathrooms, but only one of them is a That's full bathroom. Um, yes, so it's, it's only certainly... one full bathroom. Absolutely, and as was pointed out, <coughs> although, although this one I did verify does have the potential for that half bathroom to be converted to a full, which I liked, I wasn't gonna do it, and I probably wouldn't do it for a rental, but at least the, the option was there if I wanted to, to expand that half bathroom into a full. But th that's and that's my point. other point. You could co convert the garage to another room, and potentially get some more rent and make that half bathroom into a full. But yeah, you might not want to do that for full. Correct. I, just as an, as an aside, I rarely, rarely like converting garages. People want a garage more than they want, in okay. my experience. They want the garage more than, especially in, in Atlanta. People want, they love their cars in, in, in Metro Atlanta. Um, and they're gonna want that garage uh, more than they want the extra room. If they want the extra room, they'll get a bigger house. Uh, but I, I, I like to avoid converting garages if I can avoid it, but that's just me. Um, but so let's stipulate that something in the vicinity of 100-ish is reasonable. Um, I tend to be conservative, but for the purposes of this, let's stipulate 100. Because uh, I want to move on. Uh, purchase price, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, down payment, I'm assuming this is a cash transaction, so it'll be exactly the same as the purchase price. If that's the way my spreadsheet works. Um, uh, repairs, just bear with me for now. Let's assume that it's 10000 because I, you guys haven't seen the inside of the property. Um, we did uh, have a, an inspection, and we had an estimate of 10000 So let's not, let's not get too caught up on that. Closing costs are high. Um, real, realistic closing costs are probably more like five, 600, but I would much rather overestimate than under. So that's why I have a thousand there. Uh, again, there's no financing, so there are no points to discuss. Uh, let's talk fair market rent, because this is where uh, I see a lot of deals go down the tubes. Um, anybody wanna take a stab at, at, at fair market rent? And whoever answers, I wanna know not just what the number is, Where'd you come up with it? Why? You, how could you justify that number? And I want to hear from some people who hey, haven't spoken yet. Hey, Mitch. Uh, this is Sully. I can. Uh, hey, Sully. I can go in on that. So I actually used uh, Rentometer.com, where it gives okay. me the option to put in how many bedrooms and bathroom, yeah. and it gave me a fair market rent of eleven twenty-four, which is which is you're you're pretty correct, uh, which very similar to what you had. Cool, uh, Sully. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. I love me some Rentometer. Um, however, what I have learned is to be very, very careful with, with Rentometer because the pro version, or at least the plus version, which is what we pay for, lets you adjust a few additional knobs. And one of those knobs is how long the look back period is. Okay, three months, six months, 12 months. If you look too far back, you're looking at a lot of old data that could skew things off. Um, I also want to make sure that I'm looking for, for comparable types of homes. I don't wanna, if I'm doing a uh, house, I don't wanna compare my three bedroom house to three bedroom apartments. Um, so, and, and fortunately with Rentometer, with the version that we have that's paid, you can, uh, you can pull those out. And then finally with Rentometer, with the ver version that we've got, I can, I can zoom in and see exactly physically where those properties are located because 
um, and I know there are some folks on this call who are who are going to be with me on this one, especially in Atlanta, you can cross a street and rents go down dramatically. And if you don't know that crossing that street is going to cause your rents to go down, you could be thinking that, you know, if you, if you pick a, a uh, radius that's too small and you miss that, that street crossing, you, you could skew your numbers uh, horribly. Um, if you look too broad, it will include stuff in your numbers that will throw you off. So you just have to, you gotta, you, you wanna look at the actual, I find that you wanna look at the actual map to see where those properties are with respect to yours, because if they're too far away, you don't wanna count that uh, in, your, in your calculation. Um, I think the one rule we can all agree on on this call is for the most part, Zillow is almost always wrong. I think we can all agree on that. Every now and again in a, in a blue moon, it'll actually be accurate, but for the most part, uh, I do not rely on Zillow. Um, uh, anyone else have any, any, any comments on market rent? Any, any differing market rents? Mom? Hey, Mitch, this is Gary. Oh, hey, Gary. Hey, so uh, um, first of all, I agree with everything you said, but just another rule of thumb um, is, I mean, I, I agree that, that the really good thing to do is to look at the individual properties. Of course, if you don't know the area really well, then you can't tell about the crossing the streets and all that kind of thing. But um, the other thing is when you look at the, the, the statistics, right, they show you the median and the average and the 75th and 25th percentile. Yep. So you kind of have to know the difference between a median and, and an average, right? And I kind yes. of look at both of them and I sort of generally will assume it's somewhere in between the median and the mean or I'll go for the lower one. But actually what I usually do is I assume the 25th percentile, right? Because I, I'll typically assume that there's going to be something in there that's skewing. It's, it's just safer to be more conservative and look at the 25th percentile. Um, and then beyond that, I'll kind of look at the individual properties. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, and I, I, again, with rent, I tend to be conservative as well because especially in, in, in highly volatile times, what it rented for six months ago has no bearing or very little bearing on what it rents for now. And that was my point about the time frame is that um, Atlanta real estate rentals are seasonal. Uh, and within a year, under normal circumstances, for example, this would be the high season uh, for, for real estate. This is when April and May are when things are happening. People are moving and, and stuff's moving around. So if you look back three months ago, it was darn near winter and very little was moving. And so looking at rents back then won't tell you what rents would be now. You, you, to some extent, you want to see that bigger picture. Um, but, but absolutely, uh, being accurate on rent is going to be critical for a buy and hold deal because it's going to be driven by that fair market rent. Uh, any other comments? It looks uh, like, uh, Mona, you want to say something? Yeah. Oops, yeah um, I was going to say, I kind of, um, I did, I did look at Zillow and I also looked up all the properties are, or for rent, you know, like a three bedrooms and one and a half bathroom for rent in that area. And I kind of mm -hmm. took the average, but I also looked at the, I made an estimate of what the, um, how do you say the 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 utilities and everything is gonna cost mm -hmm. and whatever it is I multiply it by two. I don't know if what do you guys think? Do you think that would be a good thing to do? Well, for me, when I'm renting, I'm not paying utilities. So I, honestly, I don't care what the, what the utilities are because the tenant's gonna deal with all that stuff. Um, Sorry, so I, I, don't, I don't mean the utilities. I mean like the mortgage and everything else together without the utilities, kind of. And I think that came to like 600 and I multiplied it by two and I got maybe around 1200. Um, I th honestly, I think 1200 is a little bit on the high side. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about when we get to phase three about uh, how that could potentially get you a better rent. But let me, let me ask it this way. Does anyone think that 1100 is too high fair market rent for this property? Anybody on the call no. tell me that 1100 is, no, is way too high. Okay. Mitch, Mitch can uh, I add maybe, this one I more thing? I think 1100 is, is, about, is about right. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, someone wanted to add something? Perfect. Right? Yeah, Mitch, I, this is Renell yeah. uh, once again. I just wanted to say also for out-of-town <coughs> investors that are that are investing outside of a, an area that they're common with, I think it's also a good idea to ask a real estate agent that's from the area what the local rents are. Yep. Yep. Um, that I would, would mean... I would say, can I just... I'm sorry. No, I'd just like to piggyback on that question. 
I would just prefer a, a property manager just to yes. piggyback on that because most real estate agents are don't really know of don't really they're not really knowledgeable about market rents. They're more knowledgeable about areas and locations as far as in, rents and income streams. Real estate agents that I normally experience with, unless you train them, they wouldn't know like market rents or anything okay. of that. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. So, so how are you? I how are you finding market. your property manager to, to ask that question? Well, if it's Metro Atlanta, um, um, everybody on this call knows that I have a favorite property manager. And if it's an area that I don't know well, I'll ask experienced investors, hey, who's, either who's your property manager or who would be a good property manager you could recommend? Uh, when we started looking at deals in Columbus, um, Karina helped us identify some property management companies in Columbus and we could ask that very question. What would a property like this go for in your market? And a, an experienced property manager has that information on top of their head. They can tell you, I got a property two, two blocks away and it went for 1100 bucks or a thousand or whatever. And that gives you some confidence uh, that, that, they're, that they're right. Perfect. So that, that'd be the way that I would do it for a market that I wasn't familiar with. Um, Thank you. And if, Thank you, you. if you're right. trying, oh, oh sure. Uh, and if you're trying to get into a market that you don't have a good property manager in yet, uh, that's going to be your first, just as an aside, that's going to be one of your first uh, team members to add because having that person is going to make everything that much easier. Um, okay. Just, I, I just have myself. one other question to ask. I just sure. have one other question to ask. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, sure. Now, um, <clears throat> next thing I want to, I'm not sure if you want to tackle this question on right now, but like you said early on, that a lot of tenants are usually moving and looking to move, you, you know, during this time period within like May or June. But as you know, you know, due to COVID-19, um, I'm not sure because I'm, I'm really like a long distance investor. So mm -hmm. I don't really have like a really like true sense of whether like tenants are really like staying put right now or tenants still moving. I mean, I've spoken yeah. to a few people down there and they said the tenants are still moving, but you know, I'm just thinking maybe, you know, investors, we should have a little bit more reserves in our vacancy um, pot. Yeah, so here's the thing, that's a fair question uh, and it's, it's worthy of consideration. Uh, I don't wanna, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's a call in itself and I can't cover that on this one. Um, let's talk about that one offline because uh, I do have some thoughts. Okay. Um, but, okay. Sounds um, good. Okay. But let's, let's move on because um, I, okay. I want to I wanna get to these last uh, four or five items because I want to hit these at least a little, little harder than I normally would. Um, so let's kind of move on to that. Uh, and that is, okay. and again, I'm trying to keep my eye on the chat as we go through it. Uh, you shouldn't know that, that big a, a deal. Uh, insurance, we talked about that before. You should be able to get that from your friendly neighborhood uh, insurance broker. You give them an address uh, and they'll, they, the good ones can tell you within a couple hundred dollar range what the annual premium would be. So not, not a big uh, deal there. Taxes are gonna come straight off the county and city website. Uh, you put in the address, it tells you what the county taxes were, what the city taxes were, if it's in a, a city. Uh, no confusion on that. Maintenance, uh, you're going to have maintenance. Um, so you get to decide Excuse what that percentage me. is. Yes. Sorry, in terms of the taxes, because I got the same thing as 400, but what if the person who is living there has the homestead exemption? It would be a little skewed. Yes, uh, but the tax bill will tell you if they do or don't get the homestead exemption. And if they do, you're just going to have to back that out. Okay, perfect. Uh, in this case, the, this particular property, as I recall, was not... Uh, was being used as a rental. Uh, and so I don't think they were claiming the exemption. So I think we were good at the 400. But if they Perfect. did claim it, you'd have to back that out because otherwise you get a nasty shock when the actual tax bill shows up. Um, uh, maintenance vacancy management. Those are real expenses. They're not optional. You can choose not to pay someone, but you're going to pay one way or the other. You're going to have maintenance. You're going to have vacancy you're going to have management expense. If you do it yourself, you're still gonna pay. In fact, I would submit, and some of you have heard me say this, you're gonna pay more if you do it yourself because you probably don't know what you're doing. 
uh, unless you're an experienced property manager. And if you're, if you're experienced enough to do it, then you're probably experienced enough to know you probably shouldn't be doing it. But I, I just want to hit those three because those are the three that somehow people convince themselves aren't real. Oh, maintenance, well, it's, the house is in good shape, so I don't have to have any maintenance. No, you're going to have maintenance. Stuff's going to break, I guarantee it. Um, is yours going to be six and a quarter of the percent of the, uh, uh, of the uh, total rent? I mean, total uh, take? That's up to you. You get to decide, decide what that percentage is. I pick typically 75% uh, of one month's rent. Um, but you can pick whatever number you want, but that number should not be zero. Uh, same thing with vacancy. I see all the time people run their numbers and they have zero vacancy. Oh, because the tenant's in there right now, as if tenants don't ever move out. So vacancy is a real thing. In my case, I, I assume one month out of every 12, it's going to be vacant. Is that conservative? I think so, but at least I know, I know I'm not going to get burned. That works out to 8.3%. Um, and then for management, uh, right now, whoever's got that phone going on, please mute yourself. Um, uh, I'm assuming 10% of rents are going to be paid for management fees. Um, maybe you get a, um, hey, Karina, can you help us out with that? Um, maybe you get someone who can do it for nine, but you're going to pay somewhere between nine to 10% in uh, management fees. Uh, any questions about that? Any disputes? Any, anybody want to? Hey, Mitch. Yes. This is Sully again. I have a quick question. So for okay. maintenance, are you including your capital expenditures on that? Uh, technically speaking, I'm not. And here's why I, I don't. Um, I don't personally, because for my spreadsheet, I'm assuming that I'm making all capital expenditures up front uh, in my estimated repairs. I'm making all the CapEx stuff there. Will there be some ongoing CapEx required? Possibly. And it, it, it kind of gets fuzzy because uh, I'm going to set aside the money for maintenance, whether I spend it or not. Um, and so if in the first year I only need $500 worth of maintenance, then I got you know, the 325 excess that I can set aside towards the next year. Uh, but I just want to make sure that my numbers include something for maintenance. If you want to uh, uh, lump CapEx in with maintenance and make that, you know, instead of 825, make it a thousand or whatever, then that's fine. Uh, but that's, that's dealer's choice. Technically speaking, uh, I'm using these expenses uh, to come up with a uh, a, a total annual operating expenses, and technically speaking, CapEx is not part of annual expense of uh, operating expenses. Uh, it's a separate thing. Uh, so that's why I didn't include it here. But anything that's left over from your maintenance budget is going to be extra money that you're going to use for whatever, whatever comes up. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I just have one more thing. Um, so as far as uh, the percentages for maintenance and CapEx, we kind of included those together about 9% and then vacancy, we were uh, conservative with it and we did 10%. How do you, what do you think about those numbers? I think they're fine. I mean, I think you've got to balance being conservative enough so that you don't get burned and not so conservative that no deal is good enough for you. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that people compromise their standards. I'm just saying, make sure that you come up with a number that you can live with um, that actually doesn't put every deal that you that you see out of your range, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Mitch. Yes. This this is Gary. Hey, uh, Gary. So so you have um, management and you have vacancy, and so the vacancy your the eight point three percent looks like you're assuming that there's you know one month a year vacancy. Correct. Or so, which then suggests to me that you're going to have you're you're assuming conservatively turnover. Uh, every year. If you have turnover every year, then don't you also need to include a lease fee? Like if you're, are you assuming that the management is, the company is going to charge you a month or a half a month to find a new tenant? Um, technically speaking, it will be in there. Uh, and if you want, so this is a, if you will, it's a broad stroke. You can always drill down and make it a bit more detailed. For a back of the envelope kind of number, this for me, I found to be good enough, but you could always bulk up that that you could book up the vacancy number to accommodate uh, the, the additional uh, cost for turnover, or you could factor it in as a separate line item. So yeah, those, those, that's not a bad idea. And in fact, your model could be as detailed. That's the beauty of it. You can make it as detailed as you want it to be so that it includes all that stuff. Uh, for me, again, I, I try to balance. I want to have enough stuff so that I can you know, run the numbers fast and not miss anything, but not so much that, you know, my eyes blur when I look at the spreadsheet. So it's, it's entirely up to you. There's no right or wrong. But yes, technically speaking, that's going to be an expense that you're going to have to incur. Okay, thanks. Um, 
So let's get to the fun part of this, uh, which, um, and, and there should be no, um, no argument on these, um, that, you know, gross scheduled income, which is what I would expect to get uh, if everybody paid without any issues, uh, which is the 13200 uh, the uh, operating expenses, we saw here that the expense ratio is 35%, which is, you know, not too bad for uh, property in, in Atlanta, uh, Metro Atlanta. Uh, I got uh, 46, 45 in operating expenses. Uh, we're not doing any financing, so I got no debt. My net operating income is uh, 85, 55, and I get that by subtracting my operating expenses uh, from my uh, scheduled income. And um, then I get my pre-tax cash flow by taking that NOI and adding back in, if I had any, um, any debt service uh, that I'm making, any, any mortgage payments that I'm making uh, on the deal. I have no debt payments that I'm making, and this is a cash transaction. So I get an 85.55 pre-tax cash flow that's annual, divide that by 12, and that's where I get my magic 713. Uh, and then I take that, uh, pre-tax cash flow and divided by what I have to put in to get this deal done, which in this case is going to be the 92 down payment plus the 10,000 in repairs plus the thousand dollars in closing costs. And I get an 8.31% cash on cash return. So um, for this deal, if you were to buy this deal at the price that we're talking about, 92,000, you're going to make, you should, you projected, your model says you'll make 8.31% cash on cash and you'll rake in $713 a month in positive cash flow. Uh, my question for the call is, is that a good deal? It depends. <laughs> yes. It depends, so, yeah, it depends yeah. on the individual. Yes. So the answer to that question, of course, is yes, it's a trick question. It depends on what, it depends really on what your goals were, right? This is the goal yeah, achievement exactly. part. If your goal was to achieve 7% and $500 a month positive cash flow, then this is a home run for you. Uh, but if your goal is 10% and $1,000 a month, then this does not meet your needs. And it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of what your objective was from the start, which is why for those of you who aren't comfortable yet doing these kinds of analyses, you've got to do enough of this so that you can start to see what numbers show up for your market. Uh, if you did a hundred of these and you saw that they were all about 8.3, when you see a nine, you get excited because you've seen nothing but eights for the last 99 deals. Uh, however, if you run a hundred deals and you see nothing but 12s and 13s and occasionally you see an eight, the eight's not going to get you, or the nine, nine's not going to get you excited because you know there's better stuff out there, but you can't make that assessment until you've done a bunch of deals. And so if you, if you don't have deal confidence right now, it's because you're not seeing enough deals and because you're not running the numbers, and that's what this call is all about. And again, this is just the, the first of what I hope will be a bunch of calls, uh, and the purpose of this was just to get people into the, into the practice. I don't anticipate that we'll walk through the the process is, is in, in as much detail as we did this time, but I want people to be comfortable with the idea that this is just math. I mean, I, I didn't do anything magic. If you gave this exact spreadsheet to, or th these exact numbers to any other um, investor, if you ran this through the calculator at Bigger Pockets, it should come up with the exact same numbers. This is not anything you know magical that that Mitch is doing. This is just this is just an assessment of what what the performance is of this deal. And the, the question that, that has to be raised is, does this do it for you? And each person on this call is gonna have a different answer. For some people, this is a slam dunk deal. For some people, if I can get 10% deals at $1,000 a month cash flow, I'll turn my nose up at this deal and never even consider it. So it's all relative. What I beg of you though, is whatever your financial goals are, I, I urge you, especially now, not to compromise them just because you wanna get a deal done. If you decide that you need to get 8% and 500 bucks a month, please don't start filling with your numbers so that you make the deal work and give you what you need by, well, you know what, maybe I'll just you know, reduce the taxes or I'll reduce the insurance. I'll, I, don't, I'll, I won't make the, the vacancy quite so bad because when you do that, you're kidding yourself and you're, you're, you're driving toward disaster at, at breakneck speed. Uh, let me pause and ask if anyone has any questions about this before we move on to phase three. Yeah, Mitch, I have a quick one. Sure. 
Uh, you were saying that for this particular property that you were going to pay uh, 92,000 cash. Yes, uh, yes. What my question is, is if you actually have $92,000 cash, do you, would you really want to tie that money up? Wouldn't it be better just to put 20% down and get a loan to, to free your money up to buy your second, third and fourth rental property? I mean, because if you can mortgage these properties, that's called good debt. So why would you waste your whole 92,000 on one house? That's a, an excellent question. And the answer to that question lies in, okay, what kind of down payment would you need to make? What kind of interest rate could you get? What kind of payment would you have? Uh, and what are the terms of that financing? And the beauty of that is that it's gonna be different for each person, but you could, and each of you could do a side by, and that's the beauty of this, a side by side spreadsheet, do one cash, and we do this all the time, and then do another one with financing, and then see for yourself which one actually has the better numbers. Because I don't know, it depends on your, if you're, if you're getting, if you're paying 8% financing, probably not. If you're getting 4% financing, yeah, probably, but you'd have to run the numbers. Um, okay. Those of you who know me know that I'm not a huge fan of banks because I've seen what banks do when banks get scared. Banks cut and they run and they leave people holding the bag. They did it in 2008 and they're doing it right now. So if I never get a bank loan to buy an investment property, I'll be happy. For the record, in 21 years, I've never gotten a bank loan to buy investment real estate. We can talk about that in a separate call, how I did that, but I'm not a big fan of going to the bank. Um, Cause I've seen banks call stuff. I've seen banks go under, I've seen banks get in trouble and then it's, it's, it's their problem becomes your problem. So um, I would just say, be careful, but run the numbers. The numbers will tell you if assuming that you have bank financing, if it still makes sense to do the deal, because yes, you get to do more houses, but you got to pay that bank. And most banks are going to want to amortize that payment. So you're going to be forced to pay equity each month. That doesn't really help you. It's going to sit dead in the property. Uh, it'll make the bank feel better, but it's not going to make you any better off. So, so it's not a, it's not a yes or no, good or bad. It's a run the numbers and do a side by side comparison for yourself. It'll depend a lot on what kind of financing you can get. So there is no generic answer. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, any questions about cash on cash return or the net cash flow calculation? Everybody get where I came up with that? No questions on how that came about. No disputes as to my, my math. Tamar, I'm probably butchering that name, I'm sorry, wanted to know what your personal cash on cash return requirements are. Um, I'll say them, but I, I hesitate to say them because I don't want people to think that, that mine should be theirs. Uh, and mine are based on the kind of deals that I can see. I can typically get deals at 10% cash on cash-ish, nine to 10%. Uh, I will not do a deal that has less than $200 a month positive cash flow. And the reason for that is because in 2008, we saw rents retreat by about, by more than that, by at least that. Um, we, we'd, and again, in the price range that we were talking about. So a thousand dollar house, a house that was renting for a thousand dollars one day, a month later was, you could barely get somebody in there at 800 bucks. And if you were only making $200 a month positive cash flow, you're now at zero because you, you've just reduced your rent by 200 bucks. So your cash flow goes to zip, but at least you're not negative, right? If you had a hundred dollars positive cash flow and things go horribly south, now you're negative a hundred bucks. Uh, and that's, that's what killed us. That's what killed us in 2007 and eight is we didn't have any decent cash flow. Uh, and I wasn't doing my calculations back then. So I didn't know how bad it was. It was probably in the under in the sub $100 range. Uh, and so when, when rents retreated during the Great Recession, we got slaughtered because 100 bucks in negative cash flow, a couple hundred bucks is not disastrous for a house. But when you got like 20 houses or 30 houses, yeah, that racks up pretty fast and you go, bro you go broke in a hurry. So uh, the disaster is not knowing what your number is uh, and not providing enough of a cushion. I see people all the time, oh, I'm going to do this deal. It's only got $75 in cash flow, but it's going to make me money over the long term. There is no long term. There's what it does based on the, sh on the sheet. And um, if you are looking at 75 on day one, don't bet on it getting a whole lot better because you may not get past that first year. Um, so I won't, my, I personally won't do deals that have less than a couple hundred bucks of positive cash flow. The more is the better, but, but nothing less than that. There's just, you just, you're, you're asking to be crushed when things go sideways. Um, 
I want to move briefly uh, into, because I know we're running out of time and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to honor my, well, I tried to honor my commitment. I knew that half an hour was going to be kind of rough, but hopefully people aren't uh, bored out of their minds. Uh, looks like we're still holding on to most of our folks. I want to get into phase three because I want to show you folks something kind of cool and uh, I'll just, I'll throw it out there and see if, I'll just I'll say up front, I have no stake in this. I didn't invent this, but I know a lot of folks here haven't seen it. And I just want to understand, I want people to understand what the possibility is. I'm a big fan of single family houses for one reason primarily, and that is people can own single family houses. And right now, uh, there are people scratch, scratching their heads, wondering how can I get off this rental roller coaster and own a house. Um, and they have no shot at doing that anytime soon, unless someone like us comes along and says, hey, how about I let you move into my beautiful house, rent it for a year or two, and while you're living in it, you start working on getting your credit or continue working on getting your credit to the point where you could potentially buy it. Does that sound like a good idea? Most people right now will say, heck yeah, let, let's do this. I get to live in your beautiful house now and spend the next couple of years working on my credit. And then when I can qualify for a mortgage, I buy the very house that I've been living in, sign me up. Uh, that's called a lease purchase. And I have been doing lease purchases since 99. And I'm not trying to sell anybody on them. I just want, want you to see what lease purchase does to the numbers. Uh, specifically, these two numbers, the fair market rent, uh, whoever that is talking, I can hear you, uh, please mute yourself. Uh, fair market rent, let's assume that we don't get anything more than fair market rent. Uh, although my experience has been that I can charge a premium rent for a premium product and lease purchase is perceived to be a premium product because everybody wants one. But let's assume that I don't get that. The thing that I wanted to focus on is this estimated earnest money uh, because my favorite words in the English language are non-refundable earnest money. When someone agrees to do a lease purchase with us, they're saying, I want to buy this house so badly, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay you a certain chunk of money up front uh, for the privilege of being able to buy this house in a year. Um, and I understand that if I don't buy the house, I'm not going to get that money back. It's legitimately earnest money. If you don't buy the house, you forfeit your earnest money. But if I buy the house, you'll credit my earnest money toward the purchase. If that's the case for a 90 some odd thousand dollar house, I would probably be looking for about $3,000 in non-refundable earnest money. Let me be clear, this is not a security deposit. They are never going to get this money back. They understand it, they sign 15 different documents saying that. This is money that they're paying on a purchase agreement. So we're gonna do a lease and we're gonna do a separate purchase agreement for a specific purchase price and their earnest money on that purchase agreement is gonna be 3,000 bucks. What that means though, is I get to take that 3,000 bucks and put it right in my pocket the day I get it. Um, and that takes that 8.31% and makes it 11.22%. So I get a 3% bump, which is not un unusual because I'm basically charging about 3% in earnest money. I get a 3% bump on my cash on cash just because I'm collecting 3,000 bucks up front from the tenant. Uh, they're happy because they get a chance to buy the house in a year. I'm happy because I get to get their 3,000 bucks. I get a better quality tenant. And if they do tear the place up, I got 3,000 of their dollars to help make it right. I don't have a security deposit, so I'm not having to fight with them on how I hold it and where I keep it and do I have it in escrow and do I have to pay interest on it. It's not, I don't even collect a security deposit. I don't need to collect a security deposit because I've got this non-refundable earnest money sitting in my pocket that they're never going to get back. So uh, any questions if they buy the house? If they, yes, if they buy the house, the $3,000 gets applied to the purchase, which simply means I took a copy of the certified funds check they gave me when they first moved in and I show it to their underwriter when they get ready to qualify for their financing and say, hey, they gave this to me a year ago to buy the house. I don't have to pay, cough up the money. I just have to show them that it was paid. And they say, okay, great. We're credited towards the purchase of the, of the house, just like you would for any other earnest money. But I don't have to cough up the cash to show it to them. I just have to show them that it was paid. I'm only going to collect, obviously, certified funds. I'm not taking cash. I'm not taking a personal check. Um, and I'm collecting this in addition to the first month's rent. So when they come to the closing, to the signing ceremony table uh, for the lease signing, they're going to bring $1,100 in certified funds for the first month's rent. 
and $3,000 in earnest money. Yes, I get this all the time. Why would you do this if your goal is to buy and hold? Um, because yes, my goal is to buy and hold, but I can buy and hold next year uh, and have sold this property at top dollar with no negotiation, um, no, um, well, if I do it, um, no agents involved, um, and, or at least not, there's no agent on their side, so there's only, at best, 3% commission between me and my property manager, nothing on their side. No negotiation, no inspection, right? Because they've been living in the property for the last 12 months. So if there's anything wrong with it, they did it. Um, and I get my top dollar. So when I'm selling it a year from now, I'm not selling it for 92 that I paid for it. I'm selling it for close to the 120, 130, 140 people we were talking about earlier. Uh, and so... I'm getting a huge windfall and because I'm buying, I'm getting it sold a year later, I get long-term capital gain. I get everything that I could possibly want in a sale. And then next year I go buy another piece of real estate. So if this is your only deal and you really want to buy and hold, maybe you don't do this, but if you get three or four properties and you did one out of the three or four this way, you would be okay with that. I would think. Um, and again, this is not, I don't want to turn this into a lease purchase thing, but, but that's an example of a, of a phase three strategy that takes a an eh deal, 8%, 8.3% cash on cash, and makes it an eye-popping 11% deal that, whoa, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm seeing the questions come in. Do I need to negotiate the purchase price up front? I need to set the purchase price, but there's not any negotiating. This is the price it's gonna be a year from now. And if you don't want that price, then you don't want this lease purchase. Lease purchase, as long as it appraises next year for that price, what do they care? Honestly, if it's if it if it doesn't appraise, if I set it at 120 and next year it only appraises at 110, I can be the magnanimous big guy and say, you know what, gosh, um, I'm going to do you the big favor and drop it down to 110. I'm going to take that $10,000 hit and we're still going to get this deal done at 110. What have I lost? I'm still making a ton of money, uh, and I got the maximum amount that I could because if it appraised for 110, then that's 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 what I can get. I can't get any more. Um, uh, so yes, uh, the other question I often get, and I know we're at an hour, so I'm, I'm going to start wrapping this up, uh, is um, what percentage of folks uh, get the, what, what's the conversion ratio for lease purchase? And again, I don't want to turn this into a lease purchase seminar. I just wanted to throw this out there. We're going to, next week, we're going to talk about financing um, because I, to me, that's magic. Uh, for those of you who talk, have heard me talk about that. Um, but, but to answer the question, I'll answer it this way, because uh, this is the only way that I've learned to answer it in the last couple of decades. Nobody who has wanted to do a lease purchase successfully has not been able to do it because of us. Every single time it didn't happen, it's because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. We laid out a plan for them that they would, if they do these things for this next year, you qualify for the mortgage. Maybe that list is pay this on time and pay this thing down. And if they did those things, they'd qualify for a mortgage. We want them to qualify. We have a party when they qualify because when they qualify, we get paid. So it's in our best interest for them to qualify, but we can't make them. It's their credit. And ultimately they've got to be able to, to fix their credit. So we, we lay out a plan for them to follow. And if they follow it, they can get what they want. And if they don't follow it, then they don't get it. So for those who followed it, every last one of them got their house. Um, and it was a good feeling for them. And I love that. That's a lot more fun for me than just being a landlord forever. For everybody that didn't, that wasn't serious, they didn't get it. And I didn't feel the least bit guilty because we gave them every opportunity to get it done. Um, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna leave this here because again, this is a topic I could, could and have talked about for, for, for hours. Uh, and again, I didn't wanna make this about lease purchase, but that's an example of an enhancement on the back end. Another example uh, was alluded to a few minutes ago, which is not so much financing, what if I went to this seller and said, hey, instead of me paying you $92,000 up front, what if I paid you $10,000 now and the rest in payments over the next 20 years? Um, and I'm not going to dive into what that would mean, except to say that for somebody who might have concerns about taking a tax hit, if they profited $92,000 in, in a single tax year, that solution may be better for them. They may be more excited about that than getting all the cash up front. And if they, allow, if they accepted that payment plan, that's seller financing. That's great for them. That's awesome for me because that does exactly what uh, was mentioned earlier, except I don't have to go through a bank now. I can get that directly by dealing with the seller. And if I could do those kinds of deals, I don't need banks. 
and that's largely what we did for the last 20 some odd years is the, those kinds of deals. Um, so anyway, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm chuckling because there's no way that I was even close to half an hour, uh, but I hope uh, the folks on the call got something out of this. Um, I don't um, expect anyone to be in a position yet to do one of these. I mean, I'm sure there are people on this call who could do one of these. I'm happy to take the next week's call. Uh, we'll send, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to keep closer. Well, the good news about next week is that I won't have all the preambles. So the 15, 20 minutes of, 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 of how you analyze the deal, I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to propose that we cover. Um, so it'll be a lot. We can just dive right into the deal and start talking about the mechanics. And so I think that could be done in half hour to 45 minutes. And we can spend more time on phase three, which is to me the fun part. But uh, let me say this, the, we will send out the link for signing up for next week's call. I don't know that I can go back. Oh, Karina's already got it. I should have known. Uh, so in the chat, you'll see that there's a link uh, for signing up for the next call. Um, if you found this to be valuable, um, let me know. Uh, I, I, as you can probably tell, I enjoy doing this. This is fun for me. Uh, and I hope that, that, that the goal will be achieved, that people will get more comfortable looking at deals. Um, it is somewhat self-serving because the more comfortable you get looking at deals, the more deals potential you'll buy from somebody, even if it's not me, but hopefully me. Um, but at very least, uh, I want people to get comfortable doing deals and see that this is not uh, rocket science. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, most of you have my number. Feel free to give me a call if you have any questions. Uh, thank you all for, for showing up. Uh, uh, it's uh, almost eight o'clock on the East Coast and um, uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with some resources for you. Uh, this was fun for me. Hopefully it was fun for you and uh, uh, we will do this again uh, next week. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and uh, thank you all for sharing in this journey and uh, we'll talk again next week next week